Welcome to Meet the Master Series of Video Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. I'm Stefan Siewold, I'm gastroenterologist and I'm consultant for interventional endoscopy at the Center of Gastroenterology of the Hirslanden Clinic in Zurich. I've been working with NIP at the Department of Interdisciplinary Endoscopy at the University Medical Center in Hamburg for almost 10 years. On behalf of Professor Raju, co-editor-in-chief of VideoGIE, I first would like to thank NIPU for giving us this interview. Nipsohendra, as you all know, is one of the foremost pioneers in therapeutic endoscopy. He is known as the inventor of several endoscopic accessories, including the Sohendra Universal Catheter, the Sohendra Lithotripter, the Tannenbaum Biliary Stand, and the multi band mucovisectomy device duet. Nip was born in Jakarta, Indonesia. His parents migrated to there from China. He graduated from the medical school in Hamburg in 1968 and he was trained as a surgeon. During his surgical training, he started doing endoscopy in 1969. Nip, how come that you as a surgeon started to do endoscopy? Was there somebody who motivated you to do this? Oh yes, that was my mentor, surgical mentor, Professor Dr. Hans Wilhelm Schreiber. His opinion was that endoscopy is better than X-ray, so we surgeon needs endoscopy. And that was a good fortune that his medical partner refused to introduce endoscopy in our hospital because he thought that endoscopy is too dangerous and x-ray is enough. So one day, Professor Schreiber sent me to Olympus, whose European center was within working distance from our hospital. I went there and asked them to give me an endoscope. And I also told them that my chief wouldn't allow me to come back to the hospital without an endoscope in the hand. And um, he is uh, the, medical, the medical director of the hospital, powerful man, and he will be able to wire the money the next day. So after a short discussion, they indeed gave me an endoscope. So you got your first endoscope from Olympus, but how did you start your first endoscopy? Did you have any teacher? Oh no, at that time there was no teacher. So I learned by doing. So on the next day, I did my first gastroscopy with a side viewing gastroscope from Olympus. And um, I was very happy that we could see many things and found some abnormality. And we were able to take sample using the biopsy forceps. And at that time, the benefit of endoscopy in compared to x-ray, to me, was very obvious. So I did my first duodenoscopy, ERCP, when the first Olympus duodenoscope was available. So these were the first days of endoscopy. That sounds very amazing. At that time you still were a surgeon. But please uh, tell us a little bit more about your endoscopic career. Yes, my um, endoscopic career began actually when therapeutic endoscopy emerged. Owing to the surgical mentality, a surgeon like me would be irked on to immediately treat what he is finding. This is particularly true for the elderly and for the high risk patient because he knows how much difficult and 
riskier the surgical alternative is. No wonder that the first therapeutic endoscopy was done in an emergency, such as removal of foreign body or impacted stone in the papilla and bleeding control. At that time, there was lack of accessories so that I have to make many instruments like snare, injection catheter, and sphincterotome by myself. Nip, talking about emergency endoscopy, one of your most important and outstanding contributions to therapeutic endoscopy was the introduction of the use of cyanoacrylate in acute varicel bleeding. Could you tell us more about this? Yes. I remember that in the 80 years, the treatment of life-threatening hemorrhages from the esophageal and fundal varices was either using the balloon tamponade or surgery, which is associated with a high mortality. I have seen many varicele bleeding in my life because my mentor was a prominent surgeon in this field. I was fortunate to use the tissue glue cyanoacrylate to obliterate bleeding varices, which has been introduced before by radiologists for the vascular obliteration. My first case was a patient with uh, acute fundal varicele bleeding. The treatment was successful and I could save the life for this patient. Later, Stefan has published several papers to precisely describe the technique of the application of this tissue glue. This is very important in terms of successful application and avoiding of complication. Nip, you were also the first who introduced the biliary stenting in 1979. How did you get the idea and how did you do that? Oh yes, it was very interesting and funny because at that time we were already able to insert a nasobiliary catheter, but only <clears throat> with a five French catheter due to the limiting <clears throat> small walking channel of the first duodenoscope. And uh, we know that an external drainage through the nose will cause discomfort to the patient in the wrong run also by loss syndrome. So I was looking for a scissor for cutting the catheter in the duodenum in order to create internal drainage. But I realized that this idea was completely irrational because from the technical point of view, it is completely impossible. So as the proverb say, necessity is the mother of invention. On that day, I suddenly came to the idea of cutting the catheter before inserting into the scope. The material, what we just had at that time was a transfemoral angiographic catheter which was of seven friends. So that I have to use the side viewing gasoscope with a larger working channel. But on the other hand, the short gasoscope was also too short for doing ERCP, but good enough for the relatively short 
and geographical children. So I remember we have to struggle to get the scope into the duodenum and to straighten the scope in the stomach. We had earlier learned the importance of the straightening technique in doing ERCP. So finally, the first standing was successful. Now let me show you a short video to better explain what I said before. This is the seven French transmemoral abdominal angiography catheter. The pigtail end of the catheter is cut to be used as a stent. For the stent placement, we need to assemble the two parts of the catheter over the wire again. The tip of the wire is hooked so that the assembly can be inserted as a catheter. This will allow to and fro movement during cannulation trial. To lift the stand in the bile duct, the wire is forcefully withdrawn. Later, thanks to Don Wilson, we got the first biliary pigtail stand set of Cook, Denmark. This is the X-ray picture showing us the first biliary stand using the side viewing gastroscope. Very interesting, Nip. Apropos Don Wilson, founder of Wilson Cook Company, today Cook Medical. Could you say some words about him? Oh yes, of course. Don was a great promoter and generous supporter. Owing to him, the endoscopists from all over the world are gathered like a family, of which other medical disciplines was envious. You remember Don rented an apartment in Hamburg for young doctors coming from many countries to us to learn therapeutic endoscopy. We owe him very much. Nip, I had the good fortune to uh, work with you for almost 10 years and uh, I also um, uh, still remember um, all the pioneering work and also the efforts spreading out the endoscopic uh, interventional techniques such as um, using not the glue only for variceal bleeding but also for biliopancreatic leakages and also our work uh, in treatment of pancreatic abscesses. So that was an outstanding time uh, for me. Yeah, I had also a good fortune, Stefan, to have you as a team member. And all what you just said was your merits. Apart from your great scientific work and uh, teaching at activities, you are the one who always look for the harmony between the team members and the foreign doctors. As the forward says, one of the senses of life is to learn how to teach. In this regard, you are really, for me, a shining example for the young generation. Thank you. Thanks, Nip. Now, let me ask you a last question. This year is the 50th anniversary of ERCP. 
Um, what is your opinion about the future perspective of ERCP? Today, diagnostic ERCP has been mostly abandoned by the US and MRCP, whereas the therapeutic ERCP is still being doing in the same manner, like 50 years ago. That means first cannulation, then contrast injection prior to sphincterotomy. At that time, we didn't have EOS and MRCP, so that opacifying the biliary duct is mandatory to confirm the indication for sphincterotomy. We know that acute pancreatitis is the most hazardous complication of sphincterotomy stem from repeated cannulation of the pancreatic duct. So in order to reduce this risk of sphincterotomy, I think we have to have now a paradigm shift. Because the key, the key question is how to avoid unwanted cannulation of the pancreatic duct. I mean, the selective cannulation of the bulk duct is very decisive. On the other hand, I realize that selective biliary cannulation is actually only possible if one can see the target. That means the orifice of the bile duct in the papilla. Now I would like to show you in a short video a simple, non-risky way to expose the biliary orifice in the papilla. For this, we use a modified Erlangen type sphincterotome which has a short nose of one millimeter and a cutting wire of 10 millimeter. Here you see a picture showing you the principle of precut. The first step is the anchoring of the tip into the orifice of the papilla and then incision of the roof of the papilla to identify the orifice of the bile duct and pancreatic duct respectively. To incise the roof of the papilla, we use pure cutting current. Compared to the needle knife, the cut is fully under control and the catheter protects the pancreatic orifice from the current. By this way, the biliary and pancreatic orifice are exposed. This will allow a visually well-directed cannulation. I hope this relatively simple method will be encouraging and getting spread in the next future. Thank you, Nip, for this outstanding teaching and for this interesting interview.